So you mentioned pie charm. Let me ask you the uh, the big subjective question. What's the best IDE for Python? And you're extremely biased now that you're with Microsoft. Um, is it PyCharm, VS Code, Vim, or Emacs? Historically, I actually uh, started out with using Vim, but when it was still called VI. Uh, for a very long time, I think from the early 80s to, uh, I'd say, two years ago, I was an Emacs user. Nice. Between, I'd say, 2013 and 2018, I dabbled with PyCharm, uh, mostly because it had had a couple of features. I mean, PyCharm is like deriving an 18-wheeler truck, whereas Emacs is more like dri driving uh, your comfortable Toyota car. That's that's that you've had for a hundred thousand miles, and you know what every little rattle of the car means. I was very comfortable in Emacs, uh, but there were certain things it couldn't do. It wasn't very good at at sort of, at least the way I had configured it. I didn't have very good tooling in Emacs for finding the definition of a function. Got it. When I was at Dropbox, exploring a five million line. Python code base, uh, just grabbing all that code for where there, where is there a class foobar? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that if you grab all 5 million lines of code, there are many classes with the same name. <laughs> and so PyCharm sort of once, once you fired it up and once it's indexed your repository uh, was very helpful. But as soon as I had to edit code, I would jump back to Emacs and do all my editing there because I could type much faster and switch between files when I would when I knew which file I wanted much much quicker and I never really got used to the the whole PyCharm user interface yeah I feel torn in that same kind of way because I've used PyCharm off and on exactly in that same way and I feel like I'm just being an, an old grumpy man for not learning how to quickly switch between files and all that kind of stuff. I feel like that has to do with shortcuts, that has to do with, um, I mean, you just have to get accustomed, just like with touch typing. Yeah, you have to just want to to learn that. I mean, if you don't need it much. You don't need touch typing either. You can type with two fingers just fine in the short term, but in the long term, your life will become better psychologically and productivity-wise if you learn how to type with 10 fingers. If you do a lot of keyboard input, but for everyone, emails and stuff, right? Like you look at the the next 20, 30 years of your life, you have to anticipate where technology is going. Um, do you want to invest in handwriting notes? Probably not. More and more people are doing uh, typing versus handwriting notes. So you can anticipate that. So there's no reason to actually practice handwriting. There's more reason to practice typing. You can actually estimate back to the spreadsheet, the number of paragraphs, sentences or words you write for the rest of your life. You could probably, <laughs> you could probably you go again with the spreadsheet of the my spreadsheet. life. Huh? Yes. I mean, all of that is not actual, like converted to a spreadsheet, but it's a gut feeling. Like I have the same kind of gut feeling about books. I've almost exclusively switched to Kindle now, so ebook readers, even though I still love and probably always will the smell, the feel of a physical book. And you, the reason I switched to Kindle is like, all right, well, this is really paving. F the future is going to be digital in terms of consuming books and content of that nature. So you should get, you know, you should get, let your brain get accustomed to that experience. And that same way, it feels like PyCharm or VS Code. I think PyCharm is is the, the, the most sort of sophisticated, featureful uh, Python ID. It feels like, I should probably at some point very soon switch entire, like I'm not allowed to use anything else for Python than this ID or VS Code, it doesn't matter, but walk away from Emacs for this particular application. Because so I think I'm limiting myself in the same way that using two fingers for typing is limiting myself. It's, I'm, this is a therapy session. This is, I'm not even asking <laughs> questions. 
but I'm sure a lot well, of not, people are thinking I'm not going right? to stop you. Uh, I, <laughs> I think that that sort of everybody has to decide for themselves which one they want to to invest more time in. Mm-hmm. I actually ended up giving VS Code a very tentative try when I started out at Microsoft and really liking it. And it sort of, it took me a while before I realized why that was, but, and and I think that actually the founders of VS Code may not necessarily agree with me on this, but to me, VS Code is in a sense, the spiritual successor of Emacs, because as you probably know, as an old Emacs hack, the the key part of Emacs is that it mo- it's mostly written in in Lisp, and that that sort of new features of of Emacs usually update all the Lisp packages and add new Lisp packages, and oh yeah, there's also some very obscure thing improved in the part that's not in Lisp. But that's usually not why you would upgrade to a new version of Emacs. There's a core implementation that that sort of can read a file and it can put bits on the screen and it can sort of manage memory and buffers. And then what makes it an editor full of features is all the list packages. And of course, the design of how the list packages interact with each other and with that that sort of that base layer of of the the, the core immutable engine, but almost everything in that core engine in Emacs case can still be overridden or replaced. And so, VS Code has a similar architecture where there is like a base engine that you have no control over. I mean, it's open source, but nobody except the people who work on that part changes it much. Uh, And it has a sort of a package manager and a whole series of interfaces for packages and an additional series of conventions for how packages should interact with the lower layers and with each other and powerful primitive operations that let you move the cursor around or select pieces of text or delete pieces of text or interact with the keyboard and the mouse and whatever peripherals you have. And and so the sort of the, the extreme extensibility and the package ecosystem that you that you see in VS Code is a is a mirror of very similar architectural features in Emacs. Well, I'll have to give it a serious try because uh, as far as sort of the hype and the excitement in the general programming community, VS Code seems to dominate. The interesting thing about uh, PyCharm and uh, what is it, PHP Storm, which are these JetBrains. Uh, specific IDs that are designed for one programming language. It's interesting to, when an ID is specialized, right? They're usually actually just specializations of IntelliJ because underneath it's all the same editing engine with different veneer on top. Where in VS Code, many things you do require loading third-party extensions. In PyCharm, it is possible to have third-party extensions, but it is it is a struggle to create one. Yes, we, and it's not we, part of the culture, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah we. That, I remember that it might have been five years ago or so, we were trying to get some better MyPy integration into PyCharm, because MyPy is sort of Python tooling and PyCharm had had its own type checking heuristic thing that we wanted to replace with uh, something based on MyPy because that was what we were using in the company. And it for the for the guy who was writing that PyCharm extension, it was really a struggle to to sort of find documentation and get the development workflow 
going and and debug his code and all that. So that that was was not a pleasant experience.